um, thank you very much. And I'm uh, very grateful for this uh, invitation uh, by the NEF Law College. Uh, I extend a special word of thanks uh, to the principal, Dr. B.C. Barua, uh, to the guest of honor, Dr. Aparajita Barua, uh, to Dr. Hema Gogoi, and the entire faculty uh, of NEF uh, Law College, uh, which uh, includes my former student, Namrita Kashyap. So thanks uh, very much to all of you for uh, this invitation uh, to speak and for your kind words uh, of introduction. Uh, as, I, uh, as has already been announced, my uh, uh, talk is titled uh, In the Shadows, COVID-19, Gender and the Constitution. I would like to begin with a message of solidarity to Akhil Gogoi and Sharjil Imam, both held in custody even after being infected in jail in Guwahati and testing positive. The arrests and detention of anti-CAA protesters is one that must be challenged. But over and above that, the continued custody and refusal of bail for detainees found COVID positive is a gross violation of the right to life, liberty, and dignity under the Constitution of India. I mention these two names out of the many, many detained similarly because of NEF Law College's location in Guwahati. The COVID-19 pandemic has drastically altered our relationship with courts and law. The debates on the gender implications of COVID-19 are shrouded in constructions of the shadow pandemic that the lockdown has triggered for a range of vulnerable actors along the periphery. Isha Ray in 2020 recalls how the gender division of labor and the necessary coping of scarce water uh, scarce water supplies brings into question new kinds of inequalities inherent in the seemingly neutral demand to the six-step rule that is demanded by this pandemic. The pandemic, she reminds us, stratifies, even if it kills equally. COVID-19 might not differentiate, and I quote, COVID-19 might not differentiate between Prince and Popper, but running water does. These divisions on ho of household labor have implications across the class hierarchy, of course. For example, worries about care work and housework done by women and how this invisibility is likely to get dismissed anew during this pandemic. But they are especially harmful when they offer legitimate logic of public health to reinforce historic notions of cleanliness, untouchability, and the risk of pollution. These implications are likely to be unprecedented, but worse, their persistence and extent are unpredictable, especially as impunity marks the dominion of our current climate and through the rhetoric and rule of our leaders. These rhetorical appropriations of what the family is and who is seen worthy of protecting not only lays out the ways in which the ideal citizen ought to perform, but it also dismantles the foundation of B.R. Ambedkar's philosophy and the fundamental tenets of the Constitution of India. As Dr. Ambedkar pointed out, and to recall Mahatma Jyoti Bapule, Gulamgiri or slavery is now the method of rule. The treatment of workers, the working class and their disposition and the reduction to conditions of servitude in their life never witnessed before, call into question the very basis of the fundamental right to privacy declared by the Supreme Court in Puttaswamy versus Union of India in 2017. We cannot help but mark this as the local validation of carcerality and surveillance that plays out simultaneously in very different ways in different locales. Jail can be the starting point for our discussion on gender and the pandemic. We have countless illustrations of which I take the most recent. The detention on, Ju on uh, July 10th of the gang rape survivor and her counselors in Araria in Bihar on charges of contempt of court while the accused still remain at large. The survivor was released after a week on the orders of the chief judicial magistrate in Araria, but the counselors, Tanmay and Kalyani, 
both members of Janjagran Shakti Sanghatan, a registered trade union, were held in Dal Singh Sarai jail in Samastipur district, and this is a quarantine jail. These social workers were held in jail for close to a month till the Supreme Court granted interim bail on 4th August, with Justice Mishra observing that, I quote, it was a totally impermissible order by which they were sent to custody, unquote. The same Mahila police thana where the FIR on rape was registered was the thana that registered the contempt case against the survivor and her, her counselors. COVID-19, the Supreme Court directive on keeping prisons decongested, the trauma of rape, the critical role of caregiving to survivors of sexual violence, Article 21 rights. Indeed, the constitution itself was trumped to uphold the carceral masculinity of a judge disregardful of the basic rights and due process in hearing victim survivors and unwilling to acknowledge the constructively vital role of caregivers. Four weeks in jail during COVID-19 without reason. If the law was, as the Supreme Court observed, impermissible, if the order was, as the Supreme Court observed, impermissible in law, it was a case of unlawful custody. Was the magistrate penalized for ordering unlawful custody? Were the social workers compensated for being held in unlawful custody? Arrests have not been made of the alleged perpetrators, but the victim and her counselors have been punished by the state for daring to report a sexual assault. But also in looking at sexual assault as custodial torture under the impunity guaranteed by the pandemic, we have the case of the custodial torture, sexual assault and murder of Jairaj and his son Benix in, the, in Tamil Nadu by the Tutukudi police, all because they shut their mobile repair shop a little after pandemic closing time. Sexual assault of men and queer persons remains an unspoken reality in custody and outside. And in viral times, it is an even greater danger because there are no systems in place, no courts, no effective forums of redressal to seek justice. What we witness is a lockdown of institutions of justice. I return now to the discussion on the shadow pandemic. In the words of Humzilem Lambo Nguka, director of UN Women, violence against women targets women and girls locked into abusive homes with men venting anger at the system on intimate partners and children. It is useful to dwell at some length on her concerns. And I quote, confinement is fostering the tension and strain created by security, health, and money worries. Can I continue? Apologies, ma'am. Please continue. Confinement is fostering the tension and strain created by security, health, and money worries. And it is increasing isolation for women with violent partners, separating them from the people and resources that can best help them. It's a perfect storm for controlling violent behavior between closed doors. And in parallel, as health systems are stretching to breaking point, domestic violence shelters are also There's reaching capacity. A service deficit made worse when centers are repurposed for additional COVID response. The increase in violence against women, she says, must be dealt with urgently with measures embedded in economic support and stimulus packages that meet the gravity and scale of the challenge and reflect the needs of women who face multiple forms of discrimination. The violence that is emerging now as a dark feature of this pandemic is a mirror and a challenge to our values, our resilience, and our shared humanity. We must not only survive the coronavirus, but emerge renewed with women as, pow as a powerful force at the center of recovery." Unquote. The articulation of the spatialities of what is called the shadow pandemic takes us to the heart of the matter of privacy. 
familial privacy and the home as the man's castle, as courts have said, his right to be left alone and the women's claims to dignity and personhood, which often militate against the right of the man to be left alone in his castle, which is his home. There is also, however, a problematic aspect of the coining of the term shadow pandemic. As Navsharan Singh points out, by identifying the trigger of domestic violence as the acute and chronic stress caused by economic insecurity, this framing of the third overlaid pandemic that is a shadow individualizes the structural problem that the lockdown embodies, a structural political choice that exacerbates the insecurity and suffering of women and girls in particular ways, even while men continue to suffer deep harms on account of those very structural reasons. So domestic violence, to put it simply, is not caused by the pandemic. It is possibly aggravated by the pandemic because support structures are dismantled. The problem to address, therefore, is domestic violence. She points out pertinently that what is labeled a shadow pandemic is in fact a second cumulative lockdown for women that renders their lives precarious, both in the private and the public domain. The impunity that is seen to reign in intimate relationships is in fact one that stretches for women on a continuum from private to public, from home to work site and highways, where large numbers of women workers trek back to their villages on foot. We have had reports of increasing incidents of domestic violence during lockdown and the opposition of women to the reopening of liquor outlets, which they see as exacerbating domestic violence. The old question of state revenues versus women's interests and security surfaces yet again in a vastly different context of heightened vulnerabilities of a different order at the family level. So too do questions of choice and private autonomy and who is seen as the owner of such autonomy or the holder of such autonomy. As Ruchi Joshi reminds us, and I quote, if there is a violent or reprehensible alcohol fueled behavior, surely it is the behavior that should be policed and not the alcohol, unquote. But it does not just end with the regulation of such alcohol, or one could argue any other substance. Consumption or alcohol consumption or our need to disengage it from domestic violence. It also brings up, <clears throat> along with these questions of how we think of the private and the social, the question of responsibility and the actors who are seen as gatekeepers of these threats and the protections within them. Manisha Gupte and Suchitra Dalvi sum it up graphically, I quote, how would women whose primary responsibility is to create a new home, earn goodwill from new neighbors, scrounge for fuel, water, and other essential items in caste-ridden rural India, and yet manage to keep their children alive in times of sh shortage and, and destitution? How would they manage? What price would women folk pay when their husbands, unable to return sharp loans, coax them to face debtors, hoping to get some res respite from repayment? And what would happen to children, especially girls, when their education comes to a halt for months on end, when we do not know, and when we know that early or child marriage becomes the norm in uncertain times, as does trafficking of women and children? The impact of pandemic lockdown, particularly on health services and education in Kashmir, which is actually la uh, laboring right now on a fourth or fifth cumulative lockdown is yet unarticulated. Violence against women is a right to privacy issue, whether it be at home, in custody or at work. And I have dwelt with each of these aspects at length elsewhere. In discussing aspects of gendered right to privacy, especially in the context of queer rights and safe spaces, the question of the right to privacy in public places did arise both as a concern voiced by the court and as something we were concerned about when discussing the moralisms that confine women 
with visible with invisible and invisible regimes of carcerality even when there seems to be a notionally uh, available right to liberty when it has come to work internationally legitimized research projects once again have pointed that the root of the problem is gendered the working woman is who the uh, who is most to blame for spreading the viral disease as shakti nagraj asks about the veracity of the attacks on behalf of an already outcast set of workers i quote is sex really the main risk factor for a virus spread by respiratory droplets when 17 people must live in a house with no running water to wash their hands so why are some forms of work and labor deemed to be viral and other forms of disentitlement to respectable housing not deemed to be the cause of increased um, vulnerability to infection this is not to downplay the threat of covid-19 to these women's lives but only to remind ourselves that their threats have been multiple and omnipresent even well before the pandemic instead armed with the new legitimacy of a public health concern their work is seen as a threat that is sanctionable with a renewed morality as natraj suggests closing brothels is and i quote grand but an empty gesture that hides the state's abandonment of migrants and informal sector workers during this crisis in a state that has predecided its fault lines a pandemic that affects the most vulnerable worker must also simultaneously punish such a worker for causing the very thing they suffer as a consequence of this just happens to be the latest iteration of how its hands get washed clean of responsibility in looking at the pandemic context we need first to cut through the universalizing discourse of covid-19 as affecting humanity at large to looking with greater care at the interlocking marginalities that exacerbate vulnerability and suffering arguing that there are two or three pandemics which shadow pandemics disaggregates realities of cumulative discrimination denying the unequal distribution of aggravated harms we witness the painful demonstration of this in the death trails of workers fleeing hostile environments to return to the place they call home the villages they had homes in the place that has been held as sacrosanct and inviolable by the supreme court in kutuswami and yet it is this very journey home that is rendered precarious trapping them between the camp and necropolis surveillance is the norm not not disease surveillance but police and check posts to keep the poor in carceral facilities those that leave die painful deaths we have in mind 12 year old jamalo madakam who walked over 100 kilometers from the chili farms in telangana to her village in chatisgarh and died of exhaustion before she reached her village 16 workers run over by a train in aurangabad 20 workers killed in a truck crash in madhya pradesh and so many more recalling them each is a difficult exercise not only for the agoraphobia phobia that it binds us in but also because there are so many of these instances of direct injustice that we have begun to rapidly lose count of the numbers of workers the numbers on the move the numbers that have walked to their deaths all in search of this place called home that will offer refuge dignity security and privacy survival importantly rescuing them from the degradations and depredations of cumulative oppression dispossession and inhumanity is at the center of our concerns the deep paradox lies embedded in the structural violence that marks lives in the borderlands where there is neither sustenance in the home nor in the work site and the roads that connect the two are disappeared by the state we can scarcely forget the large numbers of women who migrate on their own and with families in search of work among those who trekked back to their villages were large swathes of these women are we to believe 
as Indu, Indu Agnihotri asks, that these journeys were undertaken or completed by these women without myriad forms of violence being perpetrated on and against those trudging long distances to reach their homes. It is crucial to ask in this context and to remember too, as Agnihotri urges us to, that, and I quote, the long march back for crores of migrant workers was a march to home that would need to be stitched and strung together from the debris of failed crops, unpaid loans, unfulfilled promises of love, life, and caring to near and dear ones across rural India." Unquote. How have women and transgender communities coped with the lockdown and the lockout? Plantation, construction, domestic work, sex work, care work, are overwhelmingly a female and informal workforce. Both paid and unpaid care work is rendered even more precarious in the context of a pandemic, rendering care workers vulnerable to exposure without adequate protection and placing demands of care on them that increase exponentially with the difficulties imposed by a lockdown on persons in need of carers. This is especially true for nurses, midwives, hospital staff, personal carers, sanitation workers. Within care work, domestic workers face a different set of vulnerabilities related to arbitrary employment practices and exclusions. Caste discrimination manifests in aggravated forms of untouchability practices in relation to care workers engaged in conservancy, sanitation, and related jobs, and yet, the diktat to keep immediate environments hygienic and ensure patient hygiene in medical care facilities makes care work the most indispensable of all forms of work in the present context. The term social distancing has acquired a new global currency in the context of COVID-19. A wide ranging debate in India focuses on untouchability practices and viralities of the Hindu caste order that make this term dangerous in its potential to disrupt carefully crafted constitutional conversations and practices around Article 17 and the ban on untouchability, as also the treatment of Muslims in India, both issues we have deliberated on at length elsewhere. We have seen on the ground, both in cases of the deaths of workers recounted above, not from COVID-19 infection, but from COVID-19 dispossession. And there is a difference between the two. And in the Islam, Dr. Kalpana, ma'am. Dr. Kalpana, ma'am. Are you there, Dr. Ma'am? Yeah, yeah, ma yeah, I'm sorry. It, I just yes. got cut off for a bit. Uh, no worries, ma'am. Yeah. One sec. Let me just get back my text. Yeah. Um, the term social distancing has acquired a new global currency in the context of COVID-19. A wide-ranging debate in India focuses on untouchability practices and viralities of the Hindu caste order that make this term dangerous in its potential to disrupt carefully crafted constitutional conversations and practices around Article 17 and the ban on untouchability, as also the treatment of Muslims in India, both issues that we have deliberated on at length elsewhere. We have seen on the ground, both in the cases of the deaths of workers recounted above, not from COVID-19 infection, but COVID-19 dispossession, and in the Islamophobic ranks on media and by governments on COVID-19 contagion in Muslim garb, speech that the Supreme Court refused to declare as incitement to hate. The death from exhaustion of Jamalo Madakam is yet another instance of this kind of dispossession. And it points to the meaning of lockdown in India in its supremacist sense, segregation, social, economic, and governance boycott, all specifically proscribed under the Constitution of India. How do gender, caste, and majoritarianism 
interlock in the context of a pandemic to produce deaths en masse in ways that directly mock the life to li right to life, dignity, livelihood, equality, and non-discrimination, the right to self-respect, autonomy, and self-determination, and the right to the constitution as commons, all explicitly guaranteed under Putuswami. Sheila Jasanoff posts, poses pertinent questions and underscores the importance of a cross-cultural understanding. I quote, what is a life worth saving? She asks, decisions like locking down have an immediate impact on social geographies, spatial arrangements, and social dynamics. Norms of social distancing are enforced by punitive policing, and democratically elected governments now legitimately don the authoritarian, majoritarian masculine hat, as we saw in the opening paragraph. Speaking in the context of the United States, Jasanoff observes that although, I quote, it's been shown over and over that people will accept, trust, and comply with directives if they understand the reasoning, if there is a certain degree of transparency, if there is participation, yet decision makers typically don't see the value of involving the very people who are going to be affected by those decisions. In the Indian context, the question of proportionality lies at the heart of the matter. And I have written on this problem extensively elsewhere. The problem has been posed as an Article 21 issue, the right to life, personal liberty, livelihood, and dignity. We could look at a different constitutional route, which connects back to the question on balancing state interests and citizens' rights. By now, the question of the pandemic is not limited to public health. The manner in which this pandemic has been handled is a sign of the place of we the people in the imaginary of governments. We need to look at ways of reimagining our place with Dr. Ambedkar and his, idea, and his ideas of constitutionalism at the center. To explore this somewhat different route is productive. Part four of the Constitution of India, the directive principles of state policy must be an anchor for state action. Reimagining constitutionalism with what former Justice Sudarshan Reddy has called the triadic ethical framework of the Constitution, the preamble, fundamental rights, and the directive principles of state policy, and drawing upon writing that insists on the centrality of part four to an understanding of citizenship and state responsibility in a social, political, and economic democracy is vital. What this moment presents to us is an opportunity to rethink the parameters of constitutional jurisprudence and the expansive reach of the right to privacy in this context. Thank you very much. Ima, hey, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, uh, I've, I've, I've been. Thanks, ma'am. Uh, we are really very inspired by your great words. Hope to associate with you in near future. Thank you very much, ma'am. Now, I would like to hand over my co-host, Mrs. Shruti Hajarika, to hold the interactive session. Please, Shruti, you please carry on. Thank you, Hema, ma'am. A very good afternoon to one and all present here today. I, Shruti Hazarika, co-host of today's webinar, Assistant Professor of NEF Law College, feel immense pride and honor to be a part of this national webinar among such dignified dignitaries. I would like to extend a hearty thank you to Dr. Kalpana Kanna Biran, ma'am, for such an informative presentation and making it a learning experience for us. Without any further ado, I would like to begin with the interactive session. Uh, first, I would like to kindly invite Mr. Gaurav Gulati. He is an advocate High Court of Judicature at Allahabad. He is the founder of Droid Penal, Indian Law Journal on Crime and Criminology, and has organized various conferences in different cities and in collaboration with central, state, and private universities during his graduation. Sir, please kindly come forward and put your question. Mr. Gaurav Gulati, are you here? Yes, Mama. Yes. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, 
Uh, good morning, ma'am. Uh, I have a question for you. That uh, what do you think that gender-based reservations are the need of the society, especially the post-COVID situation? Hello. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, gender-based um, reservations uh, have been a very long-standing demand. Uh, we also, it, with or without COVID, uh, we have also. Uh, witnessed right through, uh, you know, the, the past three decades at least, uh, the the resistance uh, to uh, acknowledging the vitality and the importance of gender-based uh, reservations. And if um, uh, I may point to some, uh, uh, you know, uh, evidence on that, uh, we have. Uh, the uh, committee, uh, the UN committee uh, on CEDAW uh, in at least uh, three successive reports uh, pointing to the negative impact of, um, uh, you know, negligible representation of women uh, in state and national legislatures and in the judiciary. And these are vital institutions uh, where women's presence can certainly make uh, a huge difference. Uh, of course, within uh, the context of a pandemic, like I uh, said also in the course of my uh, talk, within the context of uh, the pandemic, uh, what we have is existing vulnerabilities and existing ex exclusions are sharply aggravated uh, with no mechanisms in place no effective mechanisms in place to seek redress. Uh, and, and, and that, that uh, dismantling of effective mechanisms to seek redress is what uh, complicates the vulnerability of women within the pandemic situation. So certainly there has to be uh, uh, gender-based uh, reservations as a, as a matter of policy and principle. Uh, uh, it, it, the uh, absence of uh, uh, a significant presence of women in the public domain does have negative consequences during the pandemic specifically. Uh, but I would say that this is a larger question, not limited to the pandemic. Thank you, ma'am. Our next, next question is from Ms. Bhargavi Barwa, Assistant Professor of ISBR Law College. She's a former student of NEF Law College. Ma'am, please put forth your question. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, one and all. Hima ma'am must be knowing me. And yeah, sure. Yeah, ma'am. So, yeah, I, it was wonderful listening to Kalpana ma'am and very well organized. First of all, congratulations to the team. Uh, I have a question to Kalpana ma'am. Ma'am, uh, what uh, do you think led to the condition of the migrant workers and why even after 70 years, where did the laws fail? What are your views on it, ma'am? Like, uh, even after 70 years of independence, we couldn't do much for the migrant worker, as you have very beautifully said in your uh, speech, like in your lecture, like uh, that how they have suffered. So what was the main reason behind as lawmakers where we have failed as I want uh, a little clarification in that, ma'am, if you can address. Yeah, uh, well, you know, I don't think uh, the failure is uh, uh, limited to uh, to lawmakers. It it is, uh, you know, the 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 result of uh, the uh, uh, failure to uh, implement the basic principles of the constitution. Uh, by successive uh, governments and uh, successive, uh, you know, uh, courts, I, uh, and the, the refusal of people, uh, civil society at large, in an extremely stratified society, to uh, in fact uh, be willing to question their own privilege and to uh, further the cause of uh, non-discrimination within uh, non-state and state contexts. So the, the problem that we are wit witnessing today is really a demonstration of our failure as a society to recognize the immense contribution or our immense dependence as a society on the labor 
of workers, migrant and other workers, the immense dependence of our society on workers, and also the immense, uh, the, the, the magnitude of the discrimination that they have been subjected to over several, several decades. So the, the outpouring of the, of the migrant workers or their, you know, their sudden uh, visibility in the public domain um, uh, is not a sudden phenomenon. So the question we re really need to ask, like uh, you rightly put was, uh, what, how, okay, we, one part of it is yes, we have failed. And uh, the, the, we have a visual, uh, visual evidence of the fact that we have failed as a society. The uh, road before us then, the break that the pandemic offers us is an opportunity to step back and say, how are we going to actually collectively correct this? How are we going to make the constitution the basis for our collective life as a nation? You know, so the, the, the point is not really to say that we have failed in this and that. It's not a single law. I mean, if you take Jamalo Marakam's death, uh, you can't actually isolate one single law that has been violated leading her to her death. It is a complete derogation of every right under the constitution where she has been concerned. Yeah. Uh, so the, the point for me, I think the more productive uh, route will be to say, okay, this offers us a break because there is a vulnerability that is spread across the board and the lockdown has locked everyone in for varying degrees. How do we use this break to assess exactly where we are at and what we must do with the road that lies ahead? Because we clearly have two different roads before us. One road that leads us back into our past another road that leads us into an equitable, dignified future. Because this kind of dis discrimination and exclusion and negligence uh, is dehumanizing for the victims, but it's also dehumanizing of people who are not the victims, who may be direct or indirect perpetrators. Okay, thank you, ma'am. The next question is from Mr. Thang Liang Mung. He is a PhD scholar from Northeastern Hill University, Nehu. He belongs from Manipur. Sir, please put forth your question. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Uh, my question to you, ma'am, is uh, it is regarding this uh, uh, COVID negative certificate, the which uh, hospital needed it for a person to get admission into a hospital. This surface a form of this uh, immunity passport to get admission. Wasn't this a toss against the uh, principle of Article 21 that you have a right to access to emergency health care? For example, in I think it was in July 29, CMO of Nagaland has issued that a lady was denied admission for one of uh, these negative certificates. And in uh, recent days, in Manipur, one pregnant woman died uh, for one of these, uh, for being denied of this uh, admission in hospital. So what's your view on this uh, uh, thing, these uh, gradual changes because of this COVID-19? Thank you. Um, you know, we, we have, um, in fact, in place uh, in, in different states, uh, different ways uh, in which uh, the uh, stigma attached to COVID-19 uh, is uh, perpetrated. It is a stigma. Uh, we fought uh, this stigma uh, during our uh, struggle with, uh, with the HIV AIDS uh, pandemic. We are fighting it today with reference uh, to COVID-19. And all forms of stigma uh, are a violation of Article 21 rights. The denial of medical uh, care, the denial of emergency health services, of course, is firmly within Article 9, uh, Article 21 um, protections. It falls within that 
uh, you know, within the domain of Article 21 rights. Uh, but the point uh, then is that uh, how, and, and herein lies uh, the dilemma, uh, how are we actually going to get around the refusal of uh, the refusal by um, uh, health providers to uh, open out medical facilities uh, using unreasonable terms uh, if we don't have uh, redress, effective redressal mechanisms, you see? So the, the point is just that, I mean, where do we turn uh, for redressal mechanisms? Uh, when courts are functioning in a very halting manner. Dr. Kalpana, ma'am. There are some good, uh, you know, uh, extremely good and stellar orders of the courts uh, in different states uh, that we have seen. Uh, we have also seen uh, an exceptionally uh, well organized and uh, pro people um, uh, governance in a COVID situation very early on in the state of Kerala. We've seen some very good orders come from uh, other states as well. But it, it, as, as a matter of general principle, I think what we really are struggling with is uh, combating the uh, habit of stigmatization that is too deeply rooted in our collective psyche. And that then bleeds into governments, it bleeds into medical facilities, it bleeds into every space, affecting Article 21 rights in each of those spaces. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I would like to pick a few questions from the chat box. It's filling up with a lot of questions, but I'll pick very few because of time constraints. Uh, the first question from the chat box is from Nazifa Islam. She's an advocate of Guwahati High Court. Uh, Ma'am's question is, COVID-19 pandemic is not just a health issue. It is a profound shock to our society. But in present situation, there is a mobile COVID-19 vehicle for COVID-19 test. And after random test forcefully taken to hospital, then what people should do in such case as because now the judiciary is not fully active nor the communication is adequate. So kindly please throw some light or any suggestion for this matter. Um, you know, like, uh, I, like I said, I, I said it in the course of my talk uh, and uh, later in the questions as well that, uh, yes, I agree with you, uh, COVID-19 is not only, it began as a public health issue, it's not only a public health issue. And it has, in fact, um, uh, spread out uh, in completely unanticipated directions. So it is, in fact, a public crisis. Uh, and it's a human rights crisis. And uh, any form of uh, forced uh, testing or any form of uh, coercion or uh, uh, you know, uh, unexplained uh, surveillance is uh, an Article 21 issue. If you look at the ruling of the Supreme Court, the nine judge bench of the Supreme Court in Putuswami versus Union of India, you will in fact uh, find a very, very detailed elaboration of what citizen rights are under the constitution. And uh, courts are of course um, shut down and uh, or partially shut down at least. And uh, it makes it very difficult to uh, seek effective redress. Uh, but yet uh, that absent proactive governments, it is only courts that can, uh, you know, provide us with some measure of relief, unless we are talking about nonviolent non cooperation. You know, I mean, we have the freedom struggle before us. Uh, but uh, these are really the only three options, you know, what else? 
and we are in a constitutional era so surely courts should step in on behalf of people in specific cases Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Another question from the chat box is: uh, There are lots of domestic violence cases increasing during lockdown, and judiciary is not fully functioning regarding that matter. What is the solution, if there is any? Can you please suggest some remedies, if possible? She's a her name her name is Utpala Barman, and she's a research scholar from Guwahati University. Uh, well, I, I think the uh, case of domestic violence is something uh, that is extremely serious. Uh, there have been several, uh, you know, se several uh, initiatives taken in in different parts of the country. One uh, of the initiatives is to start, uh, you know, to start phone helplines uh, so that you are actually able uh, to reach. Uh, uh, you know, the victims um, who are stuck in an abusive situation and you are actually able uh, to remove them from uh, an abusive situation. Uh, it's useful to identify um, uh, proactive government uh, officers and there are always some. Uh, there are always proactive officers. There may be very few, one, two, uh, you know, but there will always be proactive government officers and uh, in, uh, in the police and in the administration. Uh, it's useful to uh, keep them uh, in the loop. But on courts, even with the previous question, uh, you know, on courts, uh, I think, uh, you know, the, the victory uh, in terms of women's uh, cases of violence against women and in cases of human rights abuse has been that e even when courts are unresponsive, we must not stop petitioning courts. So the point is that you just, I mean, it is, it may seem like a futile exercise because they seem to have made up their minds, but you actually don't know at what point a crack will open up. Like we saw in the Araria case, uh, where the uh, CGM, in fact, uh, gave uh, let the victim out, but kept the uh, uh, social workers in jail. Um, you know, the Supreme Court just intervened. It intervened after uh, you know a petition was filed, and almost a month after they had been in custody. But it intervened with a very important observation, which is that the order was impermissible in law. The detention order was impermissible in law. Um, it doesn't take away from the injustice of the detention, but it still points us towards a possible solution. Uh, and and on, you know, on, on the Araria case, uh, since I'm on it, I would urge uh, all of you, if you haven't seen it, to look at scroll today, where both the social workers uh, who were released uh, two days ago uh, have been interviewed. And, and it is an extremely important uh, interview because they are talking about a jail that is a quarantine jail uh, in, uh, in, in Bihar. Uh, so uh, the point is that uh, we will have to use uh, every uh, you know, uh, avenue of redressal that we have in addition to activating uh, support mechanisms that within the women's movement for over 30, 35 years now, we have been running helplines, we have been running shelters, uh, so the point is to devise new and more effective ways of, uh, of reaching um, victims, yeah? to, to pass word around uh, that there are these helplines available. You, know, you could get a local scrolling on a local TV channel that if there is domestic abuse, you can contact this. So you know, get hold of your friends who are reporters on local channels or who are um, in the media, but you know, friendly to these issues, who are in the administration, friendly to these issues, and try to bring them over on your side to provide immediate relief while you combat the larger picture. I think there are two levels at which this struggle needs to be fought. One is inter, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. And this has always been the strategy in human rights jurisprudence, that you fight it on a case-by-case -case basis, and you also keep sight of the larger picture that we are talking about. Thank you so much, ma'am. The last question from the chat box today uh, is from Chinmay Chakraborty. He's an advocate of Gohati High Court. 
his question ma'am is what should be the role of human rights commission and ngos working for human rights in ensuring the basic fundamental rights of citizens during this pandemic well uh, uh, mr chinmoy has given the uh, answer in his question that if you are a human rights commission and if you are uh, a civil society organization that is concerned about human rights the pandemic is a human rights issue so it comes within your purview and therefore uh you know uh, uh, we have to in each state uh, and this has to be locally uh, deliberated on strategies you have to find ways of bringing cases before the commission and you have to find ways of forcing the commission's attention on human rights cases just as you would in case in other human rights cases unrelated to the pandemic i don't think the strategy is vastly different i think what we need to do is to recognize that the pandemic context is a human rights context thank you so much ma'am uh, there are a few questions from the faculty of any of law college that would like to ask you uh, i request dr rehana choudhury ma'am faculty of any of law college to please put forth a question rehana ma'am are you there yes yes okay Am yes. I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. First, uh, myself, Dr. Rehana Sultana Choudhury, Assistant Professor, NEF Law College. And first of all, I would like to thank ma'am for enlightening us with such uh, valuable information on uh, gender issues and COVID-19. So, ma'am, I have a query that, uh, as you all know that, uh, as you all know that uh, the Constitution of India has made several. Uh, provisions uh, regarding the upliftment of uh, women's right but even then it is uh, treated uh, india is treated as one of the uh, most worst gender imbalanced country and the covid-19 it has accelerated uh, so many issues concerning women and one of the issue is women uh, reproductive health and food security because as we uh, Uh, we have uh, collected from various reports that the mortality rate of pregnant women and other infants it is at the huge level so ma'am what is your view regarding uh, this point this women uh, reproductive health system and the food security because there is scarcity of uh, essential commodities uh, like uh, medicine supply of medicines and supply of uh, nutritious foods etc so ma'am please uh, yeah Like well uh, well you know the uh, the the problem is that uh, even if you had adequate supply of medicines and food this supply of medicines and food will reach women last uh, whether pregnant women or others um, and uh, the uh, the question of uh you know uh, the extreme and gross uh, inequality of uh, women uh, in india um, is really uh, you know uh, a, a question uh, for public education all over again uh, we have a constitution and uh, what is our um, responsibility as educated uh, socially conscious uh, rights educators and uh, civil society actors uh, to what extent and i think really this responsibility rests on each of us to what extent are we in fact combating on a daily basis the discrimination that we see around us and on what basis and, and, and at what level and to what extent are we actually able to propagate constitutional morality because dr ambedkar spoke of constitutional morality and i really think that what we are missing today is the effective and active propagation of constitutional morality as the basis of our uh, societies and because we lack in that propagation of constitutional morality and the tenets of the constitution and what justice sudarshan reddy who was also i believe a chief justice of the guwahati high court in the past uh, what he has very beautifully called 
the triadic ethical framework of the constitution, which consists of the preamble, the fundamental rights and the directive principles read together. You know, what is, uh, what is the way in which uh, we enhance a public understanding and commitment to constitutional values? There has to be some way in which we make our, uh, you know, our, our collective social life uh, completely based on the fundamental tenets of this ethical framework. And we have to make that non-negotiable, which means not only do we have to change every person around us, importantly, we have to change ourselves. We have to change our own approach to our lives and those immediately around us and change the lives of those who are around us through a process of collective public education. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rehana, ma'am. Uh, we have come to the end of the interactive session. I would like to apologize.